Eve 2020, May 30th. I am Matt Tyrone. All right, let's get started here. Looking at the EVE Online status monitor at evetechoffline.net. Tranquility the last 36 hours. Pretty nice looking curve. Looks like there was some dropout uh, yesterday. Or that could just be data not collected. I didn't hear of any uh, disconnects or people not being able to connect for a while, but it's just before downtime. It's getting to a high of about 34,780. And a low of about uh, 23,000. And your average, uh, well, for right now, current time, uh, 30, basically 33,000 players online. Remember, that is consecutive players on at one time. Let's have a look at Serenity. Since it's Saturday. Yeah, still getting a lot of interest. And uh, their highs are... This is amazing, but they're really like... Uh, they're really holding it at about 26, 27,000. Say 26 and a half thousand. And that's even down from about 27,000 uh, earlier in the week. So good for them. I mean, they're just considerable. That is the Chinese server. It's just Chinese players. Uh, but it's interesting for it's interesting is there's one time zone, right? Because that's Chinese players. But if you look, they still have a wave, a 24 hour wave as well. I mean, they get down to like 4,000 players, but uh, they're pretty solid for a lot of the daytime. So it's interesting. Serenity, it's a, it'd be interesting to really investigate what's going on there. Back to Tranquility. Looks like new players uh, has steadied out, uh, getting uh, still a ton of interest from new people coming into the game. I do think if people aren't creating alts to do a lot of that, I don't know, that extended gameplay where they use multiple accounts to do different things, uh, including botting. Uh, I do think that's down. And, uh, and so that's not necessarily a, good, um, a bad sign when you see that uh, some of the heat's coming off of the new accounts created. But it still looks pretty steady, pretty high demand. Good for CCP. Good morning, everyone. At least it's morning on the West Coast. Let's go to Dotland for some statistics and see what's going on out there. Now, Dotland's not going to cover some of the more important things that are happening in EVE Online right now, which are Triglavian invasions, essentially taking over systems. Um, we learned about that yesterday. But it does represent a lot of the conflict uh, um, between players. So let's have a look at the most violent regions in the last 24 hours. Domain tops the list in Empire Space with 5,146 ships destroyed. Let me just say, that may not be PvP. That's a lot of PvE as well. And notice how much that has jumped. Now, these invasions are only happening in Domain, so far as I can tell. Or at least in Amar Space. Uh, and Domain is the biggest part of Amar Space. So it is really um, doubled Jita's uh, numbers, or the Forge's numbers. So it's really interesting. Uh, so first place is Domain. Second place is the Citadel with 2,781 and the Forge at 2,118. You see the huge disparity between the Citadel and the Forge, and even Lone Trek in fourth place with 2,329. Uh, Those are all at about... A little over 2,000. Domain is more than twice that. So there's a lot of activity in Domain. Ships getting destroyed. In most violent regions in 00, zero Delve tops the list at six, at 762, with Veil of the Silent at 666. I'm not superstitious. And Insmother 
at 496. Those numbers are so deflated compared to domain, which towers over everything right now. Having a look at the actual systems uh, in zero, 00 space, specifically LXQ, uh, in Ethereum reach is 137 ships destroyed in the last 24 hours. T0DT in Outer Passage, 173 ships destroyed. And I believe that's Outer Hell. If I'm not mistaken, that's a renting group that had a lot of iHubs going up. So maybe there's some fighting going over that. That's not a very big amount, 173, but uh, normally we don't see Outer Passage in the top 10 systems. In some other as VD tech with 134 ships destroyed in the last 24 hours. Most violent systems in low sec. Well, invasions haven't affected uh, Tama and that is in the Citadel. That's first place with 534 ships destroyed. Kanaka and Black Rise, 313 and Prism and Black Rise, 316 ships destroyed. These are all usual top five, top 10 systems. Uh, and those are Black Rise, a big part of LOSEC. And Citadel has a, a Tama, which is one of the most um, dangerous systems inside of Empire Space. All, all over the game. So looking at the most violent systems in high sec, this will be very interesting. Coming in in first place is Raravas in Domain with over 2,000 ships destroyed. That's 2,056 ships destroyed. And 819 pods, that's unusually high for Empire Space. That means players are fighting players, or actually that means that the AI is willing to pod you, <laughs> which is new, uh, or it's new-ish. That wasn't the case long ago. If the environment killed you, they didn't punish you with a podding, but now it looks like it might. In second place, Narjia from Domain as well. And that has 1,213 ships destroyed. And then finally, Jita in third place, which is unusual, 824 ships destroyed. So what I see here is a ton of activity in Raravas. And that is the first system that was just basically taken over by the NPCs. And its security status was actually lowered uh, and I have to be careful here. The actual security rating of the system didn't change, but the system now reacts as if it's lawless. And so it is a low sec system, but its actual status didn't change. And I think I read a tweet about that that I should actually try to find because it has some clarifications. So in other words, it is a high sec system that didn't change. But the response, the protective security response to you, if you get into trouble, is gone. And that is a change. All right, where's the ratting going on? In uh, period basis, that's interesting. L5D. Hmm, period basis. I wonder who moved down there. <laughs> Let's see who's down there. Well, even if Sovereignty shows uh, Condi and Goonswarm, they just own the systems and they use the system ownership to reduce their prices on their structures because the way that Goonswarm makes money is through taxes. So what they do is uh, they make sure to have all the solve in the system and that way they can save the fuel money and then the uh, structures that are being fueled are the ones that are taxing the people who actually live in this area. And the groups that live in period basis, I believe, were kind of refugees from dead coalition. Uh, some Chinese groups, I think Dracarius is in there, and uh, I wonder who else. And not the Siberians, but um, definitely, I forgot the name of the other group. It's a, I think it's even a bigger group. So that's who's there, and they are ratting the hell out of period basis right now. Uh, and you also have Owasa in second place, and this, uh, second and third place. So those are the usual spots. You're seeing Imperium, uh, Horde, and 
Those are the guys that are doing a lot of the NPC ratting. All right, having a look at the kills. Thank you, Blue Frederico. Um, going back a second to Raravos in Domain, which is the first system that was flipped by Invasions. Uh, the system is essentially 0.3 security now, so that's how the security forces will react. Um, so uh, don't expect help if you're in trouble there. Uh, so that was a 0.6 system, I believe, before, um, but now it's a 0.3 at least as far as security goes. Which makes sense because if I think about it, there's a ton of literature that would have to change. There's a ton of uh, third-party websites like Dotland would have to change. In fact, let's look at that. If I go to Raravas, it's still uh, considered a green system. I'll tune in, I'll point it to you into the right direction. It's an ice belt too, that's important. So anybody who set up in Raravas because it had ice and it was secure space and uh, the only way you could get killed in it is if you were ganked or war decked. Uh, well, that's changed now since that's been taken over. So the security forces have abandoned it. Therefore, ice mining is as dangerous as if you were in low sec. The other thing to keep in mind is it is, it looks like it's a critical system for passage into the bleakland. So you have to pass through this. I don't think that's a big deal since I think you're passing into low sec anyway. Get a handle on this here. No, you were going to high sec, but uh, just right outside of low sec. So what I mean by that is, if you're passing through this area, um, you to get to the bleak lens, you're going to have to go through. There's no way around it. You're going to have to go through low sec, uh, basically a point three system, which could be dangerous. Uh, so this whole uh, constellation here and everything above it uh, over here, as you can see, uh, all these uh, constellations feed through Raravas. So that's a pretty important system to have security change on. Your travels are a little more dangerous than they were. Now we'll go to Killboards. See uh, what big prizes have been picked off. We'll lower it to our 5 billion threshold and we about quadruple the number of kills. So there's a lot of stuff killed between 5 and 10 billion. And uh, one fourth of that is going to be, and one fourth of this list is going to be over 10 billion. So let's have a look. Uh, in Citadel Tama, we have a dread that's destroyed that belonged to Snuffed Out, killed by Goon Swarm. They're at, uh, they're at each other's throats right now, which is very interesting since they used to be allied. In Detrid, you have Legion of X Death losing a hell to Fraternity. I think that happened, uh, it's not the first time that's happened. You remember Legion of X Death is also the one that lost the ratting Nyx that uh, a few days ago. So I don't know if it's a, it's not the same people, but the same uh, alliance. In Hamitar, uh, Test loses uh, what a revelation dreadnought uh, to the Ivana Trading Federation. Now here's a big one: Goon Swarm uh, loses a Sharon, Caron, Caron. You know, the Sticks uh, ferryman, Karen. Uh, anyway, so uh, lost to the Camel Collective. That is a 10 billion isk kill for a 1 billion isk ship. So let's see what was in the cargo. Oh, yeah, a lot of uh, it's about eight and a half billion worth of moon minerals. Ouch. 
So that was probably going to, oh, that was in 1DQ. So uh, that is the central hub of Goon Swarm. So this guy got killed in basically their, their Jita as he was going to the market. In the forge, speaking of marketplaces, you have an arc uh, destroyed, belonged to Red Frog. Ooh, that's unusual. Red Frog are professional movers. They got picked off by code. Let's see, should have probably have had a package. Here's a plastic wrap package. Ton of ships, about six and a half billion worth of ships. Mm, they don't usually use, they don't usually die, and they don't usually die uh, in, uh, in Jita. I wonder what happened there. So Red Frog gets um, an arc full of ships destroyed to the tune of 8 billion, and then the ship itself is worth about 9 billion, equaling 15 billion. Not if you do math correctly, but, you know, I'm just making estimates. Okay, so in Malpass, uh, you have Reckless Contingency at a Nyx destroyed by Inner Hell. Inner Hell being a wormhole group, probably crawled out of a wormhole, tackled it, killed it. 22 billion. In the Forge, Jita again, another freighter, this time a jump freighter, which is more expensive. Uh, sorry, that Sharon was, was not a jump freighter. I should have made that clear, so that was not... Nine billion for the ship. Boy, I'm all over the place, but that. Uh... Oh no, I was talking about the arc. Okay, I was fine. I was fine. Back to business here. In Jita, the forge, you have nuclear forest losing uh, Rhea, which is a jump freighter. Again, to code. It's a code doing some damage in Jita. Uh, this looks like it was carrying a structure, Rataru, and a lot of mining ships. So that equals the cargo of 13 billion. Because uh, this is, uh, you have 12 hulks. So that's a pretty big price tag there. Uh, you have uh, actually three Ratarus. And so somebody was setting up logistics and some ships. Yeah, that's the majority of the kill there. But, you know, you have multiple cruisers in here. Some AHACs. Uh, that, that adds up to billions. So that 13 billion cargo plus the price of the ship, which is about $9 billion, uh, equals your, your overall kill of $22, $23 billion. All right, in the Spire, oof, Marshalls. Marshalls are on the menu for the last week. Uh, Brothers of Tangra, or Bots as they're known, also killed by Brothers of Tangra. I'll have to investigate that one. And here you have Fed Up, Federation Uprising, Killed in Providence in a marshal by Dreadbomb. That is a group that lives in Providence and operates in Providence that is anti-Provi block. I think it's run by Sado, the FC from Test, formerly from Test. Let's look at these marshals. First of all, this... Uh, I want to see who's involved in this kill, and it is uh, Brothers of Tangra. Well, it looks like the rogue, dro the rogue drones um, did most of the damage on this martial kill. And uh, Brothers of Tangra, I uh, don't know if it says, it only did 5% of the damage, so I don't know if that was an accident or not, but they killed their own guy. Yeah, in fact, this guy killed his own alt. If you can see by the name, right? In, it says uh, Invader Do, Do Do Not Touch 03. That's probably the same guy, probably, but I don't know. So there's probably a story there. Anyway, Marshall itself is a rare ship, so it's um, so when it gets destroyed, it's going to be worth a lot. And then in Providence, Fed Up takes a loss of a marshal as well. This was probably at work. Uh, yeah, it was killed by Dreadbomb. I don't know what Fed Up's doing in Providence, what side they're on, if they're helping Providence, or if they're just blopsing around, using Black Ops ships to pop in and destroy things. This marshal is a rare Black Ops. Uh, 
And then we covered this yesterday around uh, this time, and that was that Fountain lost Nick's. Uh, the initiative owned it. It was killed by Snuffed Out. We talked about that yesterday. All right, moving on to timer boards. You remember that uh, we talked about Outer Hell, and I think it was Outer Passage, was uh, had about, I think it was eight or nine different iHubs that were under attack. So... Imagine some of the, what, 137 ships that were destroyed had something to do with that out there in Outer Passage. Those, those iHubs timers have all cleared here. So what we have are Forsaken Empire in VTAC N as an iHub. It's coming out in 13 hours. Uh, and Deckline, which is nearby, Health Sylvanus, Super Mercenary. That system is 4U90. Ooh, Nalsekia, Nalsekia Shulpan in Keish. That's uh, where they have uh, been fighting Pandafam, basically. That system is I 6 TAC. That's actually a very popular system. I think there's a Keepstar in it, or there was. Yeah, there was a Keepstar in I 6, I'm pretty sure. Then in Scalding Pass, you have Vindictive, uh, has an IHUB and a about 24, 26 hours in DE TAC A. Ashur Khan in Scalding Pass in a day or so has uh, IHUB coming out, P TAC N5 N9, and a second one in Scalding Pass in K212. So uh, Ashur Khan's getting some IHUBs reinforced. And there's a third one here actually in U TAC I V G H. So Ashra Khan, three different I hubs in Scalding Pass will be interesting. Also in Aquarius, you have uh, Stella Runas, Runas Kitar, Runas Kitur. I gotta figure out how to say that. Stella Runas Kitur LS TAC. Uh, I think that's on the menu for a day and nine hours in Aquarius. All right, let's check EVE Online. There's uh, some stuff coming up here. Oh, I had it this morning. But I didn't mark it down, but let's have a look. Yeah, some sharpening and rendering. So it's called uh, Sharpening the Renderer. Now, when I saw that on, uh, what was it, the uh, Pulse, which we actually should show because we didn't show the pulse i was like i don't see a difference but this uh dev blog will definitely show you a difference with this little tool you can use to sharpen and unsharpen so you just drag the tool left to right and you can see the difference and it is very clear there is a sharpening difference between the before and after so what this means is uh, ever since they went to like the higher end graphics of Oh, what is it? Uh, Fidelity FX. I forget what you call it, but it's like the version 12. We started, I remember starting Eve at version 9. DirectX. Thank you, DirectX, yeah. DirectX, I think it was 9. 9 was super stable for a lot of games for a long time. Well, we're now at 12, I think. Thanks, I would never have thought of DirectX because I'm on a Mac. Um, but the sharpening, um, but since they went to DirectX, they put a lot of shading in there and it looked pretty good, but it always looked a little blurry. So I think they're really dialing that in with some, with some sharpening. I think it's most pronounced on the moon. Like, I don't know if you can tell from my screen, but if you use this uh, link, the moon looks so different. There's so much more detail. Yeah, it's it, you can tell the difference even on stream. I can see it. Yeah, this is the one. If you want to see the difference, uh, so planets in the moon are definitely where you're going to see a difference. On ships, it's a little less so. Even on an orca, it's it's kind of hard to tell the difference. Uh, and this, um, I, I think this is a naga. You can kind of tell the difference. It just feels like you're you've put on a slight hint of glasses to correct your vision. Everything gets a little sharper. But man, the textures on moons is 
unbelievably different. It's like you took a really fine sharpie on the edges where like where it all you know like where the the shadows and you just went along there with this extremely fine sharpie a sharpie yeah just extremely news? tiny extremely fine and you just went almost highlighting it makes it just a little bit easier to just pops a little bit more yeah all right so that is sharpening the render i think there's something about um this next this next update's going to have a lot of uh, visual visual changes. I think they CCP went over it about two weeks ago on their channel, CCP uh, TV. You can catch that at twitch.tv slash CCP. Look at the video section and look back for some art. Let's do that now so you can see. Okay, so when you go to their channel, uh, you want to hit these uh, videos link here, or tab. It's hard to see. But the videos will show you the collection of all the stuff they've done. And... I do not like the way that videos are organized, but... But if you filter by past broadcast, you can just see them in order. You want to go down about six or seven here to, um, what's the date on this? Sorry, it won't give me the date, but it just says 17 days ago. So if you do the math, uh, and that is called the visuals and Eve. And it was a great show, about an hour, 40 minutes with some of the artists of Eve online. They revealed a lot of stuff that you're seeing now back then so it was definitely worth a watch that would be the the 13th thanks i don't know why i won't give it yeah at least i would if i had one <laughs> so yeah so check that out so this do this dev blog is referring to some of that you're also going to see some new jump animation uh when you're in the tunnel you're going to see your ship to give you some reference points i get what they're doing and i'm not 100 percent sure i love that because it takes you from first person perspective to third person's perspective without your consent and therefore it it uh, messes with your immersion but i think it, you'll probably get used to it and jumping is just something that's i think it's more exciting for new people than it is for people who've been around a long time All right, what else we've got? Have we got? Looking at dev blogs here. I mean, I've got market news. I mean, news, but you, uh, you need to speak up. I have you uh, cranked the two hundred percent. Really? Yeah, yeah. For some reason, you're quiet. You know, I moved my I moved my mic further away because I'm trying to not have it be up in my face. Get it up in your I face. I guess being up in the face is the most important thing. Here we go. There, yeah. that sounds like you. <laughs> I've been watching market stuff uh, the past few days. And, uh, what have you seen? Happening. Hmm? What have you seen? Well, uh, I first I started with Plex because everybody was talking about the whole thing that was happening with Plex these past few days, and I said, "All right, well, let's take a let's take a look." And it looks like that was it was just this speculative spike that happened in the beginning, and it seems to be evening out now. And today we're starting to see normal, normal as in, you know, same as the past five, 20 days, um, numbers. So if I go to, if I go to Eve market data, uh, minimum, maximum 2.49, max 2. as opposed to two or three days ago, which was 2.7, 2.9. So Plex is mm -hmm. already normalized quote unquote wow but so it didn't it didn't spike very hard did it i mean it spiked hard but not for very long it yeah that's true that's not to say that this isn't uh gonna be a like that's not this isn't like a marker right this it's not to say that it's not gonna go up anymore it's just that the speculative spike has passed so we could see the prices continue to climb here slowly over mm -hmm. time because we're still it, it's still definitely on the upwards trend so 
and I decided, hey, let's take a look at everything else. So large scale injectors, um, kind of flattening out the curve. So they were on a downward curve uh, over the course of the past month. So uh, that flattened out. So I assume that this is just like this spike kind of just flattened out the the skill inject the large skill injector curve. So nothing too crazy. Um, but I think that flattening that hitting the rock bottom happened sooner because of the speculative uh, this speculative price spike in right. Plex. Um, so hypercores, uh huh. Well, before you move to hypercores, looking at Plex, it's something that I haven't seen in a while, and that is other trade hubs are showing up on the Plex market. Yeah. <clears throat> That's unusual, but it's very unusual that they are the lowest prices. So you have the Dixie and Amar have both two orders that are in the, well, about 2,590. Got to be very specific with these numbers. 2,590 per unit. I guess it's not many units. It's only like 90 units. Uh, this one's only one unit. This one's seven units. That's hardly countable in Dodixi. Uh, but this one's 90 units. And then you have Jita start to come in. Jita used to be the rock bottom price on, on Plex. I guess some people have some stuff they want to sell there. Yeah, this could also be a, uh, a kind of an... Uh, uh, it could be a few things. So that one plex could be, you know, some type of graph manipulation. So what happens is um, every few minutes the graph is updated in game. And if you sell just one plex, it, it blows open that graph to a yeah. massive extent, which lets little manipulations and happy fun times happen for people. So, yeah. uh, so uh, if you look at where people are buying plex, that's solidly Jita. So, yeah. Absolutely, especially now with the uh, the phone application. Right. But also, is would Perimeter be on here or not? I don't see Perimeter anywhere. Perimeter should be on here, yeah. Because if you see the station names, it says Jitta 4, Moon 4, Caldari Navy Ascent. I find it odd because Perimeter usually sells Plex, but I don't see it on this list, so maybe this is just stations well this could be within a certain time period certain time periods maybe more people are in uh yeah. jetta proper some people are i'm using you know, some people fuzzworks uh, .co .uk. so this is uh mm. this is fuzzworks uh, is a good website so. yeah great industrial website it could just be time of day you know you see that sometimes sometimes people are buying more from this place this time of day other people are blind uh, buying from a different location a different all right, hypercores. Move us on to hypercores. Yeah, hypercores are interesting. Hypercores because of the uh, the zero tax event. Is well, happening well, let's, right let's now, be so. real. You're still losing five percent. It's just not on tax. It's on hypercores. But uh, putting an order on hypernet is not free. It's only five percent instead of ten percent right now. As Correct. far as the fees. But you do have the plex the the zero percent uh, brokers tax happening uh right now the little event going on and so naturally hypercore prices spiked just a little bit they've always been on a downward trend uh since their inception Ooh, what was this in december just like, yeah december felt december like it 10th, was near january so, yeah, yeah yeah so december 10th up till today it's always been on a downward trend in general and over the course of the past three days they've spiked up this is the first time they've spiked in ages. Uh, they they usually like the rock bottom was twenty seven, two hundred seventy five thousand. Yeah, rock bottom was around two hundred seventy five thousand. They've jumped up to three hundred thousand now each. So it's a bit of an interesting spike to observe. Completely independent. It's based off of that event, but uh, yeah, it is still something to take note. No, unfortunately not. We can only guess off of these numbers. But what what a way that we can tell to see if general trade volume has gone up is if, after the event at least, the price of the hypercores is at a higher point than before the event. 
which would tell us that it's moving at a large, which tells us that there's more hypercores moving uh, than before. So that's one way to kind of tell, but you can't get exact numbers, unfortunately. Yeah. CCP has them. Not I accidentally muted myself before the application hid, so I apologize yet again for muting. I'm going to leave my channel open. Um, what I just asked was, is there any way to know about the hypercore volume and how much it is being sold? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can see that uh, I'm on Eve Marketer uh, in-game as well as a good way of looking at it. But yeah, we can see how many are being sold or how many are being moved per day. And we're seeing pretty consistent numbers between 80 to 100,000 with the past few days being, you know, relative spikes of 100, 188,000 on the 28th. And then yesterday being 121,000. But it, You're pretty... talking about hypercores moving off the market. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So for those that don't know, Hypernet Relay is essentially a, a raffling system, but to run it, you need fuel. And that fuel is hypercores. The hypercores are your currency to be able to put something on this Hypernet Relay. And so by checking the price of Hypernet cores and how much they're coming off the market, on and off the market, you can kind of tell how busy the actual relay is because the relay won't work without those cores. <clears throat> Therefore, if you have a lot of people buying Hypernet cores and the price is going up, then you could assume the relay is seeing some more business. Uh, people can hoard them, of course, uh, the, the cores, so you, you don't know exactly, but that's just a good assumption. Yeah, and especially with the current event, it's it's a very good assumption, a very easy assumption to say that it's just being used more. Yeah, so uh, some thoughts on that. Uh, Thiophelis here says, the Hypernet is just a platform for people to rip off players. You got to be pretty unsmart to be buying anything from it. I don't know if I agree with that. I do I think... I do think the that approach, the ahead. bottom line is this, though. Let me just say that the losers of it are subsidizing the winner. That's how it works. And the chances are you're going to be the loser if you don't, you know, buy half the tickets or something like that. But the point is the losers subsidize the seller and they subsidize the winner. Well, I think if you look at it like this, if you look at it from the from the point of, a, of just a general market perspective, then yeah, absolutely. But fundamentally, it's gambling, right? So if you approach it from the perspective of gambling, well, then it's just a then it's an enjoyment proposition at that point. So you have to ask yourself, well, how much right. joy am I getting from taking each spin? If I get a lot of enjoyment from really big spins, okay. But if you get a, a lot of if you get more enjoyment out of a whole bunch of smaller spins, it's a different story. So, yeah. So the real question you have to ask yourself is: Do you find the gambling aspect fun? Do you find um, uh, testing your luck fun? If the answer is no, then well, there you go. Ls uh, Winfield says, "Eve is full of isk sinks. That's one of the less worse." What do you think of this as a sink? I think as a sink, it's one that's very unique in its in it in its style uh most sinks exist in in a form of a tax either corporation tax npc tax well let's be you know let's be clear about this though this is not a sink in the traditional sense the tax yeah. is a sink yes uh, the fees that you pay to play on this market is a sink that money gets out of the game out into the ether but this is basically facilitating trading between players. That's not an actual sink. So if uh, Litchgrave were to sell something to various people and I were to win it, uh, that is not a sink. It's a trading of ISK for an item. So it's kind of... That a, item is transferred and the ISK that is used yeah. by those players, yeah, is, is given to me, yeah. So a sink, just to be clear, refers to money that is leaving the game that nobody gets. And you're sinking money out of the economy permanently. So that's the difference. Yeah, and I think definitely as a sink, though, I mean, from a perspective of, of it being a sink, it's definitely one of the more unique ones. And I think, you know, definitely that's that's a good thing, you know, as a more unique uh, side to it. And I think exploring these unique sinks is definitely, yeah. I think, something she's, she be, a CCP should, should look into, you know. 
Yeah. Uh, Rufortis, Rufotris says, I spend $100 million on Hypernet. I consider it lost and spent the moment I buy the tickets. If I win, it's a nice treat. There you right. go. Yeah, and exactly. And this is a, it's a, it's a mentality. It's a good mentality to have. It's one of the mentalities that people talk about in even in the real world when it comes to investing in a in stocks. Right. Whenever you invest a stock, consider it gone. It consider it a loss. Right. So only use what you want to only sacrifice or put into the stocks. And in this case, the hypernet, what you want to get rid of, basically. Yeah, I think the hypernet works for very specific items. For instance, bulk selling doesn't work on Hypernet at all um, because you have to put up one, you, can, you can't put up a batch of orders, you can only put up one thing. So if you want to sell tritanium, for instance, you can only sell one tritanium. Uh, that's not worth the price at all uh, of entry or anything. And nobody's going to buy that. So you can't do bulk minerals. You can't do bulk materials. You can't do uh, any number of salvage. There's a lot of different things that just won't work on this hypernet. What will work are unique items. And I think that was one of the reasons that they put this in the game. I think there's various reasons, right? One is this is an old tradition. People have been doing this sort of thing uh, on the side for since 2005 when you had... Summer Blink, was it called? Bef way before Summer Blink. Summer oh, okay. Blink just kind of formalized everything. It was like the corporate version of this lottery that people used to do. But corporations used to do it uh, for their own members. So they'd basically say, everybody throw 10, 10 million into this pot and one of you guys is going to get this, um, you know, T3 cruiser. And they used to do that for themselves because it was kind of a fun thing to do. And then people did it on a grand scale. So there was the big Eve lottery and it would happen like once a year or once every few months. And that was a big version of it. And it would be much bigger ships and much bigger um, participation. So that got going for a while. Summer Blink kind of formalized that and made it into a business because now you put some programmers together with the idea. The idea was tested. The audience was there because you could see it. And you had Summer Blink being born and formalized. It got into trouble when it was given some stuff by CCP. People protested. Uh, Summer Blink kind of uh, was dancing around some uh, gray lines and got into trouble, it fell apart. And that's when you had other casinos really take off, like I Want Isk just took all those customers in. And instead of giving out ships, they would give out... Um, it was gambling games for ISK. So you pay ISK and you could possibly get more ISK back. And, and then you had a whole banker system that worked with that where a person who was filthy rich in the game could take their money, use it to facilitate the process of um, paying people. They're basically clerks, right? They're paying people their winnings and they're taking in their, uh, they're taking in their uh, tickets or you know, whatever raffle tickets they bought. And then the bank would pay them a certain percentage for the amount of volume they moved of their own money. So they're essentially using their money uh, to rent that money to I Want Isk, and they were getting paid a commission off the volume that they used. So I Want Isk didn't have to have any huge fortune up front to facilitate a large amount of gambling. It was all the banker's money individually as they were freelancing, that sort of thing. So the point is, this has been this long tradition of games of chance, they call it, that players put together for themselves. It was separate from the game. And CCP said no to all that because it was starting to get, starting to become very, very mainstream. <clears throat> and we can go really deep into this topic uh, with certain people who have aspects that are very interesting to it. Um, but essentially what bankers were doing or what casinos or whatever we're doing was they were they were really um gamifying boredom because a lot of people were sitting around bored but they had a lot of isk and so when there wasn't a fleet they would just gamble and that was how they would pass the time and relax and do all that sort of thing with um what was it before that summer blink it was different there were players who needed a ship and they're like oh i really want to get into an a hack but i can't afford it let me try my luck with the uh, with this um, summer blink. And that was the same setup, you know, 12 tickets for an A-hack, but the tickets were really cheap. 
So a guy that didn't have enough money to get into that would throw his money at it and see if he could get an A-hack. And that allowed him to participate in something sooner because he could, if he was lucky, get an A-hack before he could actually afford to get it. So that was a different thing. So the point is all this gambling, it kind of gamified your boredom for most people. And, uh, and that ended up amassing massive fortunes. And it was when that money was used politically, that's when the game changed because you couldn't really assail uh, out of game casinos. And if you can't fight a casino when it's out of the game, how are you supposed to defeat it? It's an endless supply of money. And, and one of the most ironic things was during this huge war that happened in 2000, I want to say it was 16, 15 or 16, uh, they call it World War B on one side, they call it Casino War on the other, that the people who were financing the casinos at the time were the people being attacked. So you had a lot of, uh, because some players just don't care about the politics in the game. They belong to the big empires, but they're just there to kind of farm and harvest and uh, you know take advantage of the area and the resources that they can get to make money. And they're passing the time gambling at the same time. They have no concept that the money they're spending to the gambling is actually impacting the war that's destabilizing their farm. Like that, that wasn't happening for them. So it's kind of ironic and funny. Uh, the point is that uh, CCP saw this and said, well, this endless amount of ISK generation is destabilizing the game. It's unassailable wealth, and we need to take it out. Now, they didn't say that in the game. That was probably one of the th reasons they did it, but that they didn't say that. The reason they put forth was a different reason completely. Yeah, Amar puts his finger on it. Oh, actually, he, he doesn't. He puts his... Uh, uh, finger on something else. Uh, but CCP basically said, look, we've moved our headquarters to London. London has gambling laws. This is a sticky business we don't want any part of. Therefore, we're taking games of chance completely out of the game, and you are not allowed to do that. And so that essentially killed the whole gambling system all the way back to the lottery system. So everything was just stopped. And they said, we will explore a way in the future for you guys to have your corporate or alliance level uh, raffles. We'll, we'll find a way to do that. Because even those were killed off. And that was the tradition, you know, that dated back more than 12 years when, this, when this, all this business was happening about five years ago. So what happened after that, uh, unexpectedly, nobody saw it coming. But just last December, I guess December 10th, CCP announced or released this hypernet relay, which is essentially a lottery system. And it was to satisfy a lot of people that, that like the gambling aspects of uh, sitting around bored, don't know what to do. Let's throw some money at the hypernet, see what goes on. And it falls into the whole like, you know, dystopian casino, um, you know, obscene amount of money moving that kind of stuff, it all kind of fits into the genre of EVE Online. So that's why they put it in there. I don't know if London was an excuse, but it was definitely good timing for them to say, uh, we, can't, we can't allow gambling to happen in the game like it's happening with players running it as a, as a parallel to the game. It had nothing in the game. There was nothing about EVE Online in the gambling except a lot of the flavor. Uh, so it was happening on the side, but it was using the people who play EVE Online, because that's who the client base was, to do this gambling thing. It was using yeah. ISK, right? And so. I think that uh, the, these, you were talking about this unassailable wealth, uh, you know, ivory towers that nobody can fight against. And yeah, that is definitely something that even without the problems, I think CCP would have shut down inevitably anyway. I mean, if you look at just the way that these kinds of industries impact other games like csgo where they had you know match fixing right i mean these are games where allegedly these kinds of systems can't even directly impact what's going on but in eve online where everything is so heavily tied to the market and and your wallet i mean oh geez yeah well the problem is that it's okay if you do gambling, that's fine. It's in, you know, we have a whole state, Las Vegas, that lives off it and other places too. The problem is that uh, kids play video games and you can't put the gambling 
facility in a place where they can stumble upon it and play it, at least not in a unregulated way. So that was where the big problem is. So I think CCP could have said like, okay, only 18 and over can play EVE Online. <laughs> Why would they do that? Um, because it has gambling in it. Game kind of does that already anyway. <laughs> it does naturally select for that, but... It, it does, it does kind of, I mean... No electronic, like, no electronic entertainment is going to say, this is uh, not playable by anyone under 18. <laughs> like, that's a huge potential I mean, it, market. I think we've talked about use the average age of the eve player base though i mean it's not yeah, it's it, college it's not, student you know, to uh it's not call of duty players like yeah no it's uh even though some of us are here hi <laughs> no uh, different people play different games uh but they always play it on and off uh, eve online is a game you kind of play on and off because it's really a lot more well how do you put it it's a virtual world so you check in on it Right, so oh, how's my virtual life going? Oh, I'll check in on it when you get to a certain place. You can play the game as an arcade game, <laughs> call it arcade game, but as a video game, right? Like this is a video game. It has spaceships that go pew pew pew. I get to fight other people. I get to fit my ship. I get to think about how to win strategically. But there's a whole other sea of options in Eve Online. Uh, building a social circle, having that social circle build, uh, extract from planets, extract from moons, setting up an empire that you defend and patrol, structure management, um, exploration. And then there's a whole encounter side of thing where you run missions or you now can fight for Triglavians, aliens that are invading the uh, known universe. Like there's a lot of different things you can do. It's not just PVP, but um, all those options, you can play it all actively. But you can also sit back and be called to duty like a reservist. That's a CTA. When your group goes to war, then you show up. You show up more often. Sometimes you do alarm clocks and wake up in the middle of the night to play. It's more of a lifestyle if you think about EVE Online. Sure, you can play, and you, you, but people take it in casual bits, and they kind of sit there and groom things and own things and have potential to do things, but they're not constantly doing things. That would be too much to ask for, for people who've played this game for 10, 12 years, 15 years, even five years. I heard somebody say, I'm kind of new. I've been playing for five years and just have to stop a minute and think, what other game can say that? Games come and go inside of a window of five years. It's true. Inside of a window of three years. So if you're EVE Online and you're a new person at three years, that's like, first of all, it's intimidating for new people. But second of all, that's a different game completely than what you're used to. And so there's nice. a question there from Tiger. How many people, except if you have never tried the Hypernet Relay? There was a, there was a question about... Uh about EVE Online's PEGI rating and uh, PEGI 12 and ESRB T for teen. Okay. Yeah, I didn't know what it was officially. So at least three people of 120. <laughs> I'm not. Okay. Four people of the All right, keep people. Xing up. X up if you have never played Hypernet Relay. Um. But it bring, but it, it bring, actually that the 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 rating system brings up an interesting point, which is, um, you know, MMOs. The one of the things that always shows up on on MMO tags is online interactions not rateable by ESRB or something like that, right? So, so certain things that happen within the game just can't be rated. You can't you can't account for it. So. You know, that probably legally gives some kind of gray, you know, gray area to play around in for MMOs, which notoriously it has. I mean, I can think of a few off the top of my head that have done that. There, put a dollar sign if you have engaged with the Hypernet Relay, either put something on or bought something off it. It was actually, I said four earlier, but it was, it got up to about 15 people at least. Yeah. 
Yeah, actually, if you've <laughs> put a put a dollar sign if you have engaged with Hypernet Relay and put multiple dollar signs to measure how much you use it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll put mine in here. Well, they go on. I just want to quickly uh, wrap up some of the other interesting points in the market. Um, Tritanium uh, hasn't really shifted in the grand scale too much these past few days but it has gotten more volatile and uh, mexalon has definitely taken a massive spike over the course of the past week or two mexalon explain that uh i assume it has to do with uh well i mean minerals are tied to plex prices just like everything else plex is the anchoring currency so we can anticipate that massive spike being attached to it but Mexalon specifically is a Nullsec bottleneck. And one of the things that people notice a lot is, you know, large buyouts, right? Um, but no uh, no large amount of Mexalon was moved uh, in, the, in the giant price spike. So it's pretty safe to assume that this was just attached to the Plex price. Hmm. Let's see if I can get a graphic version of the of the minerals that we're talking about. Yeah, Eve Marketer has a good one. I think that's down though. Is it? I'm here. Oh, it was down at one point. That's why I stopped using it. Oh, it's back. Ugh. It goes up and down. It's, it is okay. the most inconsistent of all the websites, I'll admit that, but it's also the closest that, you know. We well, but it has a, a, it has a nice graphing uh, program out of game. Let's see. Uh, so it looks like Mexilon is jumping up. Well, but this dates back to, well, let's see. Open it up for the year. Yeah, it's, minerals in general have been slowly climbing as they become harder to harvest. You see a, a nice big jump here from a medium of 70 isk per item to a 91. So that's quite a jump. But it seems to have softened up in the last few days. I guess the hype is wearing off. You're not showing the Eve market on the stream? Yeah, oh my! Still on I'm the, sorry, guys. Full of mistakes this, full of mistakes this morning. That's okay. It happens. I had it up on a browser, but it wasn't the one I was showing. So I'll just do that again. You can see it's been climbing steadily for the last year. What? Yeah, we're good. Okay, good. You can see it, right? Yep. I'll show you the last. I think that's the last year itself, and you can see the minerals were. Um, tanking, tanking, tanking. All minerals were tanking. Let's open up all minerals. Yeah, minerals have been tanking for a long time, just due there. to the uh, the over um, accumulation. This is tritanium. Uh, so all minerals were kind of soft uh, and had been for a long time. Tritanium was down to four point six isk per unit on the medium. Uh, and then when changes were announced, you start to see all the minerals go up over the last, I would say, six months. And the tritanium is all the way up to, again, it was at four something. Now it got up to 10, which uh, is more than double its number. It's softening up a little bit to about eight. That's still double what it was a year ago. Uh, so that's just your baseline because tritanium is the one mineral that that uh, is used in just about everything and it's your baseline for all the building you do you will use more tritanium than anything else but if you look at all the other minerals there are certain ones that get um, used for specific things like ships or uh, certain things that null sec will use and that's why we call it a null sec bottleneck because it's more important to null sec than it is for other things and that's also uh, depending on the items that are in vogue, that's also can be a choke point. So if a, if all the items that you build for a shield doctrine ship require Mexilon, for instance, then that becomes a bottleneck because multiple alliances are going to be wanting to shift to the new meta, which may be shields, let's say, for example. And so then the price pull on 
Maxillon will be really strong, and that's when you'll see it bottleneck. And some groups will kind of mess with other groups and make it more expensive for them to build those um, shield things. So for instance, and this is just a for instance, you have a group that mines like crazy, like the Imperium. They have control over a ton of Mexilon because they're mining it naturally in their place. On the other side of the fence, you have a group like a Pandemic Legion. They don't have a lot of miners. They have a lot of warriors. I'm using archetypes. And those warriors um, have to buy their minerals from the market. So they'll go to Jita. So what the Imperium can do in this situation, since they have their own Maxillon, they don't have to worry about the prices, and they will buy up all the Maxillon on the Jita market, where Pandemic Legion goes to shop. And that creates a higher price for them to get what they need. So their shield doctrine would cost 200 million per ship, as opposed to the Imperiums, who might cost 100 million per ship. And uh, that's one way that PvP happens on the market. It gets very, you can really track this when it gets very specific. Um, and know, these so, fights are happening all the time. You know, this isn't yeah. just during wartime, this is all the time because if you can put your opponent into an economic uh, disadvantage, even from, the, from an earlier state before a fight yeah. breaks out, you can really just tip the scales in your favor. And this happens in, in, in a small scale too, like a group of hot, hot dropping uh, blops will come in and destroy a ton of mining ships, for instance. And then they themselves will bring mining ships and put them on the market at about 30, 40% higher than usual. And the farmers or the miners would basically say like, eh, I don't have time to like create my own or to run to the market to buy it. So I'll just buy it locally. So the pirates create the economic condition that they sell into. So they're making money on both ends. They're looting your stuff and they're selling you more expensive stuff to replace the stuff that they destroyed. Contempo Enterprises, thank you for the raid, 07 man. Oh, thanks. Yeah, that's totally a thing that happens. Um, Catching Spider says, but then goons could sell the mechs on the market for 200 million, so the cost is still the same. Well, yeah, it'll eventually even out. Uh, but in that in that window where they haven't put the items on the market yet, that's where you make the risk. And also, it, it depends, like, right, like the economic, the problem is, how do you tell the all the Imperium members that have Mex, Mex, Mexilon not to sell? It's hard because the price is going up and they're like, I can make a profit. I think I will sell. And it's hard to hold them back. So I don't even think they do. Um, but we're talking like, there's going to be some players that sell stuff. We're talking strategically, like a, we're talking hundreds of billions worth of minerals. If you're not using hundreds of billions worth of minerals to really shape the market, you're not doing much to it because there's too many different entry points, too many people involved, right? But when someone that is doing economic warfare on an empire level through the marketplace, they're talking, we're talking hundreds of billions in movements. Uh, at least that's what I was told. So the other thing is, uh, it's really specific. It's hyper specific. This kind of gameplay of economic deprivation is uh, specific when it comes to ships like super capitals. Um, most of the groups now adopted a policy of we only build super capitals for ourselves and our allies. And so even if you belong, even if you're renting from one of these groups, you are not allowed to sell those super capitals to their enemy because you make their life harder. This was learned when I think uh, the Northern Coalition, there's these four major alliances, Morsus Mihi, Razor, uh, I don't know if it was Ethereum Empire, but there's different big groups with smaller, what we used to call pets, you know, smaller satellite alliances that lived in the North for a long time. And they were industrialists, but they had a strong military because they could build all these big ships. But they started selling it to Russians, I think, and to other groups. And those Russians used those ships to come over and clobber them. So at that point, people saw that and were like, don't sell ships to your enemies that can destroy you. So all the super capitals have been kind of, uh, you know, you, you deprive people of uh, super capital ships from your marketplace. 
Oof, we're getting all into the the history and the economics getting into of the weeds, online. man. Yeah, yeah, that's how it happens when you do these kinds of things. Could be wrong on some of this stuff. Uh, totally welcome better information. Some people that watch the show or are around Eve Online have been involved in markets and history for a long, long time. All right, so you were saying Maxilon. Was there anything else that you said? Uh, I'm taking a look right now. Somebody mentioned that Kikimura's um, Pando stopped using them, so they've they've dropped in price dramatically, and that's mm -hmm. true, they have. Um, it's not the Kikimura. actual reason, though. Hey, Billy, what's the actual For the reason? Kikimura? Yeah, yeah. It's, they had the massive abyssal uh, push there like about two weeks ago. They still use Kikimoras. Cool, it's just that, that he, he hasn't... Um, he, there, there hasn't been a ton of fleets. You know, It's important to understand that Rorqual usage has gone down massively, which means the hunting fleets have gone down massively, which means the opportunities for the hunting fleets to die has gone, gone down massively. Combined with a large the, influx of abyssal supply from those, uh, from that push, which then has a follow-on effect of those people continuing to do the activity. But you said this was the last two weeks. What was the last two weeks? The this push. No, it was two weeks before that. I think right. Two weeks before that. Yeah, because I'm because I'm just looking at the graph and the 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 spike started to dip in around April 10th and that week. So this is this has been going on for over for almost two months now yeah that's much more due to just the the lack of rural content which means that the hunters don't mm. hunt kind of thing yeah kikimura is a triglavian destroyer yeah well, this is just one of those disadvantages i mean uh of information right you're in the know i'm not so it's kind of hard to tell well you can we can look at what we do know like, that's that's why I say we welcome better information. Here comes Vili with some yeah. good information. Um, here's my question. Can you describe like the rise of the Orca and high sec? Why that happened? Me? Yeah. Me or Vili? Vili? Yeah. Vili probably because he's... Well, I mean, as soon as um, the scarcity changes came in, mining in high sec became... Uh, significantly more valuable. Uh, the orc is by far the best way to mine in high sec. It's been growing in usage in high sec over e almost multiple years, I would say, as the suicide ganking of less tank ships becomes, um, like as it became more and more common. Um, and, and with this last push in the scarcity uh, event, it just created a situation where everybody saw what the best practice for mining in high sec was. And then a combination of both botting and uh, reassigned tunes uh, started making their way to high sec. They looked for the best way to do it, and they did. And then all of a sudden, that's where you end up. Right. So I, I thought Blackout played a bigger role. Well, yeah, yeah. Back, Blackout was is part of that scarcity, too, I guess, in, in a different way. Yeah. Because Blackout yeah. started pushing the bots up there and, and yeah. the regular players as well. Right. So, so orcas became, again, orcas can be tanked like crazy. So you can't be ganked as easily. What's going to cost you to gank it? And it's a hauler, essentially. It has huge cargo bays. Uh, so you put out some mining ships and you feed the orca. It sits there filling up with ore. And then you, once an hour, once every two hours, you can dump all the ore into the facility. It's just an easier, more productive way to mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nick, Nick actually brings up a really good point. It, it's not the best mining setup because it's it's it doesn't have any direct bonuses. It's the 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 advantage of it is yeah the insane tank and the fact that you can just walk away from the keyboard and not have to deal with it. Um, but yeah, a, a, like four or five coveters boosted by a by an orca well, will outmatch five it, orcas. Five, it's a six boosting orcas ship. Right? It's a mining director's ship. It will mm -hmm. boost your fleet, so you will get mining bonuses from it, but it doesn't mine. And it doesn't have any direct bonuses either. Uh, it can mine using the drones. All right. uh, there are mining drone bonuses, uh, bonus rigs that you can apply. But yeah, that's as far as it goes. Right. Uh, but it is definitely a, a support ship. It's uh, unlike the Rorkel, which used to be a giant version of the Orca. It didn't look like it. It was a different ship. It's an industrial base basically on wheels 
uh, used to be a bonus ship. Uh, but it was so expensive that people would park it in a safe zone inside of a pause force field and boost the entire system from there. When that was taken away, boosts, yeah. yeah, when that was taken away, so that was also a mining director ship that would boost uh, players that were mining out in the field. But that was taken away. And when that was taken away, uh, the uh, Rorkle transitioned to a mining ship itself with these massive, massive mining uh, drones, basically. They're giant mining drones. And the Orca itself could mine at five times the rates of, uh, of, a, of a, a Hulk, which is the fastest mining ship there was. Uh, and so at that point, Orcas were, I mean, sorry, Rorkles were just fantastic for, for resourcing, especially in Nullsec, where you had endless amounts of asteroids. So that was the meta for the last, oh, I want to say it was three years or so, maybe four. And that has recently shifted because uh, clearly they nerfed it. They kept nerfing it. They must have nerfed it like four or five times. But it, uh, uh, finally, they just did this blackout thing, which really made them hard to use. Not impossible, but just harder to use. Uh, and, uh, and with the scarcity, uh, you'll see people doing uh, transitioning to other ways of making money that are more cost effective because losing an orca will set you back. Mm, I think it's, is it 4 billion for an orca or is it two? I think it's like four or it was for, an or for a fully fit orca. Sorry. I'm sorry for a Rorkel, not an orca. Rorkel. Oh, okay. Orcas have been orca, the smaller ship that works in high sec. That thing has been as low as like four hundred million. I think it's been as high as like eight hundred million. I think it's kind of at the higher. It's been high as a billion, I think. A billion. Well. Plus. Let me check uh, it. Rorkels, at least, well, I mean, currently they're. I'm seeing them at around two, one point five to two bill. Yeah, orcas right now are selling for eight hundred fifty billion. That's on the high side. So, but then again, they've become more expensive to produce. So they take a lot of minerals. I remember yeah, when these things entered the game. In the 1.5 to 2 billion range right now. So, the historical average. So, it's about, that's not bad. That's only twice as much as a Orca. That doesn't make sense. I'm checking it out. There's none on sale. <laughs> Is there? People want to buy them for that amount. That's not what they uh, sell for. I think they sell for like twice that. So I can see them, but uh, do you have your marketer set to high sec only? Uh, I don't know what I have. Probably. Probably. Yeah. Because I can see them all in low sec. Well, no, I got all systems uh, marked off. So no, I, I see them. I see some of them in perimeter for some reason, but yeah. No, I'm seeing them at like. Oh, you know what? I had market hubs only, so I took that off. Oh, I'm dumb. I was looking at buy orders. Hold on. Yeah, I told 2. you. 2.3 billion. 2.3 billion is the lowest currently. Right. So, no, something's wrong here. The sellers are selling for 1.5 to 2 billion. The buyers are buying for 1.6, but that's all in high sec. Oh, it's interesting. Oh, yeah. So, yeah, is, no, I see that. Yeah. Is well, what we're seeing people selling them in null sec and not wanting to transport them to the to high sec where they're in demand they basically can't be transported to high sec it's kind of important to understand right if they're in yeah. null sec the, the way to get them to high sec is basically like find some way to get them to the last low sec system and then gate them all the way to a market it's not an easy process to say put it lightly you, well, these things you can't can, enter can you high bring sec Rorkles into high sec i don't know no 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 Rorkles you can't bring into high sec yeah Oh, I thought we were talking about orcas for a second, sorry. But yeah, uh, no, or orcas are orcas are a different story. No, yeah, the oracles are. Yeah, there's there's anymore. literally thousands of oracles out there that are no longer being used. Mm -hmm. The market on them is going to be busted forever, basically. Yeah. So Dreaming Warrior says you need to add the excavator. Those are those gi giant uh, mining drones to the price of the hull cost. Yeah, if you wanted to talk about how much the mining ship cost in general, but. Uh, I'm thinking of it in terms of just a mining director ship that boosts other ships, which I think it. I would say that if you go back a year before all of the nerfs happened, 
a rock will reduce your cost to about 6 billion, including the fit and the drones. You have to remember that the excavators were close to 1 billion, a billion each. each. Yeah, and there was five well, of those. Yeah. Right, five, so it was yeah, about four. Now. It was about four. That's what I thought. That sounds right. Uh, two well, to four. The Rorqual hull used to be about 2.3 bill, the drones mm -hmm. were 1. bill each, and usually you wanted to have at least a billion square to fit on it, which means they were 8.3 billion at, like, the medium end. Yeah, totally. And you could certainly increase the fit value by another billion to kind of amp it up, because I don't know all my Rorks were, like, 9.2. Wow, so. that's a lot. For that. Oh, you could easily bling these things. Yeah, I just remember them their hulls being I think that's right, two point five. That's what I remember. Two point five to like four. If you were desperate, you'd pay four. Four point one. I'd see that price every once in a while. Oh, but this is really interesting and we only stumbled upon it. The sellers are selling these things for like one point five, one point nine billion. That's like under cost. Sorry, that's it, it is definitely under cost, one hundred percent. They're selling them at a loss. Yeah. But it's not like they can reprocess them, right? The way you reprocess ships is not the same as the way you reprocess minerals. So if you attempt to reprocess them, you're not going to get... I, I don't know the exact formula, but it's not a like 60% of mineral, 70%. It's like... So that's like the, the actual like ship value at that point. Look at that. That's really surprising to me. So yeah, under cost Rorkles. And then uh, buying them... You know, people are willing to pay, but only you have to move them to like, I don't know why they, why would you buy them in high sec? Why are people putting the mark? Um, I'm confused by buy this. Buy orders. Yeah, but you can't sell to that station. That's high sec. People are, uh, you can. So you what can happens is. You can still build them. I mean. So, so what happens is the buy orders placed in high sec track into low sec, right? If they're a multi-jump buy order. So a buy order in uh, Jita with a 10 jump range will hit all of the northern low sec systems where mm -hmm. people can sell them. Ten, 10 jumps is kind of what you need from Jita to catch low sec. And then people yeah. can sit in low sec and sell you stuff and hit your buy order in Jita. Or even better, you can come to the uh, low sec TTT and uh, sell your rookles there. I yeah, see. but that doesn't... So uh, you can be sitting... The... Let me make that clear for people. So you can be sitting in low sec... And sell it to somebody in Ford and Jita that wants it, but you don't have to move the ship. It still sits in low sec. Right. The transaction happens where the ship is. Yeah. Where the where the goods are. So how, how much did uh, how much did I guess and does Oracle individually bring in per hour? Ooh, that that's different now. I think that yeah, changed ball, over ball, time. Ball the the here. original. Pre like nerf after nerf after nerf was somewhere between two hundred and two fifty, and then it was nerfed and it was nerfed and it was nerfed again. And before these ner the like the the scarcity stuff hit, you were somewhere in the range of seventy to one hundred and ten million based on what you're uh, buying. I just I just want to throw out there like I I get a lot of people but not a, not everyone but a lot of people balk at the cost of a tier five abyss ship, which is like three to six bill. And can make three hundred mil an hour today, easy, and and more if you push it. The advantage of the work will, was that it was low brain power, and it was also yeah, of scalable. Course. Those were the two real advantages. Yeah, uh, of scalability. It's like time. it's like saying Eve only costs like fifteen dollars a month to play. Not really. It kind of takes your soul. Um. And I think same with the uh, abyssal ships. They may not be that much and they can get a lot on return, but they're going to take your time. They're going to take your focus. They're going to take your gameplay. Well, I, I, I used to like super rep before I did some Oracle mining and the stuff like it, it's like you're playing like Starcraft on like speed or something like trying to, you know, maintain your ticks. Right. But, you know, Oracle mining, I would like set up five Oracles in the belt. I'd drop a super in the center so that if anything showed up, I could insta-kill it. And then I'd literally just go do my laundry and I'd go clean dishes. <laughs> like, <laughs> as long as you walk by your computer every few minutes to make sure there's no rats that spawn or killing your excavators, which oh. did happen. And I did lose a few from time to time. You know, it's yeah. it's, it's mostly fine, right? But people put on like, uh, you know, wireless headsets and walk around doing things and they can hear their their mining operation if they need to. But yeah. But That's main, a whole the different main thing. Game. Comparing abyssals is that abyssals, of course, don't get you the materials to buy titans, which is like the big Whoa. thing about the world. Do you 
do you need the materials to buy a or do you just need or do you just need isk in null it all goes towards super production regardless of whether or not you're building it and most alliances build their own titans yeah that's the bottom yeah, line. i'm just like, saying if, getting, I, if I was a dude materials. if i was a dude that wanted a titan would all the industrialists tell me to to just screw off if i didn't have minerals and just had isk no they would they would you would you would still be able to do it with isk but then if you wanted it with isk you would be super ratting or carrier ratting is the thing well let's, let's not it's like for, the yeah. for the empire builders materials are more important than isk by itself i think if you go back to a couple of years and uh, we're talking about it on the meta show and mittens mentioned the fact that one of the big advantages of, of the Imperium was this insane industrial backbone. So if they were to go into a big scale war, lose a ton of ships, they would have the resources to um, replenish them. Whereas his point was that the Northern Coalition and Pandemic Legion, they didn't have that backbone. They would have to ret- restore, retort to go into Jita and buy out the market. And hopefully there's going to be enough minerals to, to replace those Titans they had lost. So minerals have a different type of value for empire building and also as opposed to just getting an is for sure for the individual player that just wants to get rich uh, it doesn't really matter because you but but that min stuff is all propaganda like that, that's yeah not i know it is but it's there's some truth to that as well of course when is it that takes tra- a lot of it takes a lot of materials to replace a super cap fleet billy when is the trash talk tuesday thing start an uh, hour or two i think oh i don't think i'll make it to that but okay Sorry, just curious. I was going to raid them if they're around. No, they're not started yet for sure. All right. So, marketplace. What else have you guys seen that's kind of interesting? Uh, I've been so somebody mentioned Loki's, and yeah, I believe I believe the Loki the Loki received a received some type of balancing or nerf. Yeah, yeah. Loki recently. lost about one hundred and fifty power grid if your skills were maxed. And the projectile subsystem specifically lost uh, damage and application. Yeah, so there you go. A tank, but stabilized. Yeah, that was the surgical strike, along with the Legion losing like 92 grid or so at the same time. I should be more precise with my language when I say it tanked. I don't mean it it got defenses. It actually, the price went down on it. Yeah, the price went down. Yeah, Yeah, the price that it's currently leveling at the... Still, yeah, what's in, what's interesting is that Loki lost a lot of power for a lot of people, but it didn't lose any power for some people. Because like, if you weren't using that 150 grid, or you could work around it, and you weren't using for the projectile subsystem, then the Loki hasn't changed except it got cheaper. Interesting. So it w- it probably got nerfed then for big fleets, right? It was it was nerfed for its specific. Uh, overabundance as a, like a gank ship or like the the arty loki is what yeah. i'm pretty sure what they were nerfing specifically i think in null Villa, you can correct me if i'm wrong here but they're used as pretty heavy duty at least by nc heavy duty uh grapplers so they would fly in because they were tanked pretty hard and they could get close enough to tackle something uh, while the rest of the fleet could then uh shoot the thing that it tackled uh so there was always like three or four lokis per I don't know, armor, battleship fleet, or whatever. I believe they were also overrepresented in wormholes. Yeah, it's the best T3 in wormholes going way back. Both small scale stuff and the active tank and a Loki together with the range control is very oppressive. And then you had, of course, like Inner Hell, for example, that had a very, still has a very successful uh, Loki doctrine and that got nerfed as well. With those so who didn't get affected by the nerfs then? Uh, anyone who is using it for PVE is going to fit it with hams or potentially heavy missiles. That subsystem didn't get nerfed. Hams are heavy builds... assault, heavy assault missiles. Yeah. Or hams. hams are heavy assault missiles. So, uh, ha- heavy assault missiles are the short range, high damage, quote unquote, unguided medium launcher weapon. And heavy missiles are the long range, quote unquote, guided, slightly lower damage, uh, medium sized launcher weapon. 
And those are the two weapon systems that people use on the Loki for PvE purposes almost all the time. Like, obviously, people will use projectiles, but for the most part, they're using uh, launchers. And they can work around that 150 grid loss, and the projectile nerf did not even apply to them. Oh, that's really interesting. That's an interesting balance, Bass. So the, the Loki is very popular in PvE because it does not have a damage lock, so you can use launchers and you can use any any flavor missiles you want in them. So yeah. if you're doing something that requires kinetic damage, then you're going to want to be in a Tengu. If you're not in something that requires kinetic damage, then you want to be in a Loki. And you also get that extra high slot as well for utility. Yeah. Maybe that's why it's creeping up. Uh, There's a slow creep here. Well, it, it, I feel like it's the creep up is normalizing because the news that it was being nerfed made the price drop more than it ought to. So it's it's recovering to a stable level at this point, as far as I can tell. Because it wasn't the nerf wasn't as bad as people acted like it was. Yeah, it dropped to like one hundred and fifty eight million. And I think it did have a up to big impact on Logi. Sorry. Sorry, um, it's up to one. Yeah, I, think, I think it had a big impact on the Logi Loki that you know hell we're using, for example. I, I think that broke yeah. that fit. I, I had, I think, six. For some reason, I just stopped pile ships. I think I had seven, six or seven Lokis, and all of those fits broke. But they were, those were, of course, really min max. The really significant thing about the nerf is, is that you'd get way less tank in combination with the shield resistances as well. So my my most blingy Loki I had, I think it did like 2,400 EHP per second or something ridiculous like that. And it's down to 1,700 now, which is quite significant, yeah. but it's it's, yeah. it's like total overkill if you're going to do like PV stuff or something. Yeah, it's really interesting. Uh, is there any other ship? Are we talking about Kikimura fall in price, the Loki fall in price? Well, keep in mind, you're not even seeing the entire price change in the Loki because there are subsystems for it that are, you know, essentially components of the yeah. hull itself. And those uh, will take a price hit just like everything else. I, I imagine that percentage wise, the, the values of a particular subsystem for a tech three cruiser will match, but uh, it is worth noting at least, because that is a significant portion of the percentage of the price of the hull. We've had some um, short-term drops in prices on battleships. Um, battleships have been cheaper on the market for a while now, as opposed to minerals. So um, that's, that's they went up, considering the went down. Rate. Yeah, it's, it's it's one of those things that just puzzles me. Um, I think it's due to the fact that there's so, there's so many people in high sec, uh, for example that do mining, not because they want to maximize profits, they do it because they truly enjoy that game style. We have several of those in my alliance, and they want to build stuff as well. So even though quite often they make more money just selling the minerals they mine, they choose to build stuff with it instead. Yeah, and then they just undercut the market. Yeah, th that's an entirely like generally undiscussed segment of the EVE player base. So we have this wonderful ecosystem and we, we talk about it on how, how much it makes sense and all the numbers make sense and people don't do things if the numbers don't make sense. So it's a good system and a good simulator, but it doesn't take into account all the people who literally will build stuff at a loss. Like they have materials and then they could turn those materials into a thing. The thing that they turn it into will get them less ISK than the thing that they have already, and they choose to reduce the value of their assets by producing it into something. And these people cannot be accounted for in the quote-unquote ecosystem formula because they behave against its rules because they enjoy it. Well, I, I just looked at Amar and Kaldari battleships, and they're all going up in price slowly. Uh, so they are inclining. Yeah, it's, 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 it's going up and down a bit. It's it's really weird. They are, I think, like the Abaddon uses the most Tritanium, for example. And since Tritanium went up so much in price, uh, they should be selling for like two fifty to sixty on the markets, which okay. would be somewhat reasonable. And they've been down to like two twenty for a long time. It's important to understand that a lot of the people who build things, who who do industry, 
aren't actually that good at what they're doing. They're, they're not doing it with like five or ten spreadsheets that tell them the prices of things and determining yeah, whether they're, they're just doing optimal. It. They just, you know, no. they're like, I put some minerals together and I'm going to make myself a ship. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to disagree with that. <laughs> okay, you can disagree. There's a, there's a lot of, like, we have several uh, people who are really good at doing building and they use the spreadsheets and ISC power and everything. And to them, it just doesn't matter. They, they know very well that they're not min-maxing profits, but that's not the point. That's not why they are doing it. They do it because they want to do it. They, they build stuff for the Alliance just to give away stuff. I mean, there's, there's a lot of people. You, I mean, you can't do this yeah, and there, still there be are very two good groups. at what you're there, doing. There's the ones who know that they're operating at a loss, and there's the ones who don't know that they're operating at a loss. And both of these play, groups of players will continue to operate at a loss. By the way, and, uh, and like skew the market numbers. I found Galente, Hyperion, and Megatron seem to have a little bit of a dip or decline. I think probably the Hyperion more than any. Uh, Millstorm or a couple of Minimitars are flat, but the Kaldari and the Amarian battleships are steadily go going up in price. So it's a mixed bag. Yeah. I think the Domi is going to be interesting because the Domi is, of course, being used very heavily for ratting now in, in Olsic. Basically, the Ishtar, Myrmidon, and, and the Dominics replaced the V and I's we used to have. Yeah. And um, we saw uh, Bjorn B had an awesome stream uh, last night. First time ever I've seen him actually stream PvE content. He was in that system that was turned on by the Trilavans, and he used the Domi doctrine. Um, so I think battleships, since they are quite effective in these Triglavian invasion uh, systems and for that kind of content, those might see a lot of destruction going forward if we have more systems uh, being flipped over to the Triglavian side and those huge fleet fight fights in those systems. So those could very well go up in price. Because they're being destroyed now, but as far as their usefulness, they've they've always been rather useful in invasions. But now, now yeah. they're going to be in low sec and getting blown up. Although, although it should be noted that so far only one solar system has been successfully uh, pushed into first liminality by the Triglavian forces. Uh, all other systems that have progressed have been pushed by Edencom. Which is surprising to me. Well, yeah. Why do you feel that's surprising? I just thought, uh, my impression was that there were so many people in favor of the Triglavians, and I also expected a lot of people wanting to stir things up to create that chaos in Highsec. Like, there's been so much discussion about what if Neogia turns into the Triglavians, and, and you combine that, it's like, what, 45, 46 jumps through Highsec if Neogia goes low sec? There's quite a bit of talk. Uh, yeah. I'd like to see it backed up by action. I want to see people who talk about making these changes actually get these changes. Yeah. I mean, I am I do a lot of high sec uh, industry and markets and stuff, and as, as do the, the, the people I play with. So this, it's in our, our best interest to have as much as security as we can doing those activities. But for, for the health of the game, I actually embrace the possibility of, of uh, things really going into chaos mode and we see you, you for one welcome changes. our triangle overlords I can't, I can't, I can't if they, I didn't take sides but I think it's, it's a good thing for the game to stir things up I mean Isaac has been stale for years now and I think this seems to me as well that a lot of people do appreciate I know that some people um, really dread uh, what's going on because it, it, it's, it's forcing them to adapt and, and do different yeah, things that, that is true by the way, uh, well, I, think, I think it's a good thing. Comment is that two know. other systems were pushed to luminality, but they weren't blue sun systems, so they weren't changing. Right, yeah. yeah. So the, the important thing here is, so I said system that was actually pushed into Im luminality. There are a few systems that the Triglavian forces, a small handful of systems that the Triglavian forces pushed uh, through stellar reconnaissance in favor of the Triglavians, and those invasions petered out instead of continuing on and progressing into liminality. Uh, yeah. The one that did was a blue sun. I don't believe that we've pushed a yellow sun system from reconnaissance in favor of Triglavians, but the, the, the current, the current su suspicion, understanding, is that blue sun A0 and B0, B0 blues and all of the yellows will progress into liminality if pushed. But again, that's that's not confirmed. That's just the understanding. What, is, what does it mean to progress into luminality? 
So every invaded system begins in stellar reconnaissance state, which is the center one in your agency. If you open your agency windows, there's five buttons mm -hmm. in the Triglavian invasion section. Uh, every new invasion begins in stellar reconnaissance. Both sides are, quote unquote, scoping it out. And then there's three stages of progression towards each side. You have Edencom Bastion, Edencom Bulwark, Edencom Fortress. And then you have first liminality, second liminality, final liminality for the Triglavians. So... There have been systems, so each individual stage has a bar that's filled up blue or filled up red. And if it's filled up, if it gets filled up blue, then the system will theoretically progress for Eden Comets. If it's filled up red, it'll theoretically progress for the Triglavians. There has been at least one solar system that was pushed through stellar reconnaissance for Eden Com and disappeared. There have been at least two systems that have been pushed through reconnaissance for the Triglavians and have then disappeared. The only one that has succeeded when uh, being pushed by the Triglavians is the one that was a blue sun. And ye yellow suns are the other one. There's a couple of reasons why we think that, not the least of which being that uh, there have been a, a number of updates to the game files specifically focused on blue and yellow suns. There's obviously ARC's extensive work and statistics uh, showing that blue suns are the target, specifically A0s mm -hmm. and B0s and not the O1s. Mm -hmm. And lastly, uh, there's the, the, the three data streams, the three Triglavian trinary data streams, which are intercepted Triglavian communications that were just released with the Capsuleer Day event. There were three new data streams released that were different from all the others, and they address us, us directly. And they, were, they, make, uh, they make reference to imminent glory and imminent gold, which didn't make any sense until we looked at some of the videos that we had intercepted from the Triglavians as well. <clears throat> and some of those videos uh, were uh, reconnaissance reports from their Rasnaborg scouts that were reporting on stars. They had measured certain attributes of five specific different stars, and they were reporting back to the collective. And one of the attributes of these stars that was measured was imminence, and it was given a word to describe, and one of them the blue star was referred to as imminence glory. So we have a message from the Jaglavians telling us that, you know, they're going to essentially take over imminent glory and imminent gold. And then they told us what imminent, you know, imminent glory was. So we, we have game files showing us blue and yellow suns. We have the Jaglavians making two claims. One of them identified as a blue sun and it being fulfilled. So we have every reason to believe that, uh, if the Triglavian forces were to push a system with a yellow sun through stellar reconnaissance, it would then progress into first liminality at that point. Is there something on Dotline that shows you the sun type? I thought there was. Yeah. You click on, you drill down to a specific solar system, and then you click the button on across the top that says Celestials. That's right. It tells you the type of star that it is. This is a B0 blue. Yeah. So the A0s and the B0s are the ones that are known to produce Isogen 5. We don't know anything about the yellows. The O1s do not produce Isogen 5. Right. And that appears to be what they're after. That's Isogen 5 is the stuff of wormholes and many other things. They... They are able to release and produce uh, exotic matter, negative uh, negative mass, which is essentially what's required for a wormhole type thing. Thanks to Ken Cleves for that additional information. Okay. Uh, so we've covered a bunch of stuff uh, today. Is there anything in the news uh, over this last week that you guys wanted to review? Or anything going on now? I could just mention briefly that you're probably going to see a lot of structures on anchoring now um, due to um, what's the name of it? Forgotten Fort? No? Abandonment Ouch. status. But it's called Forsaken. They've been on anchoring for a month. Yeah, it's been a while. Yeah. But this is Wait, like I know for I know for tests we had anchored like 64 desires and like hundreds of small structures. Like yeah. crazy and we're still not going to get them all like it's there's still some bananas people, out there people people are also forgetting that they are anchoring stuff 
and I know this because I forgot two structures myself. So, I forgot uh, one myself too, yeah. <laughs> yeah, congrats to whoever, whoever has a shiny new Astrohus and Vitari. Somebody just and, picked it up um, out of space. Yeah, well, I completely forgot them, and like five hours later, I went to, to the spot and nothing there. And that also means that the structures have crashed on, on the market. So Athena's, Athena also dirt cheap and uh, Fortisars actually went down quite a bit as well. So if you're looking to uh, pick up a few cheap structures, now now might be a good time. Let's look and, at the price, uh, yeah, it's slumping. Athenos is like 100 million below, uh, maybe not as much, but close to it, uh, to, to the actual uh, manufacturing cost of the, of the materials. So it's, yeah, don't, if you're, if you're not one of those guys who do produce stuff, uh, stay away from producing ethanol and Fortisols and Astrohus. Yeah, structures are going to drop. They're going to be in far less use for a while now. Yeah, it's going to take, it's going to take a long time before they actually recover. Oh, yeah. They will recover, of course, at one point. But, uh, probably going to need to wait until the redistribution of minerals uh, by CCP. I think they're hovering at a year long low or year to date low. That's uh good if you want to buy them. Yeah. That's an Athenor. I see Astrohaus. It's, it's probably only going to get lower and I'm not sure why <laughs> a lot of the reason for buying them is gone because a lot of the people who bought them and put them up were the people who did not intend to fuel them. And that no longer is a working thing. We already had uh, people on anchoring in high sec when the moon mining changes hit, because that just wasn't as viable to do anymore. And yeah, then on top of that, a few weeks later, you had this change coming in as well. So, yeah. That's true. I think People started on anchoring as soon as the as soon as the math didn't work in the favor anymore. Like it was more expensive to run the drill than to mine the stuff. I mean, it didn't get to that point, um, but you did get half, less than half the value of what you used to get. So, like orca mining uh, the moons, getting like ten million isk per hour. That's just that was too low even for most of the AFK orca miners in. He's 10 million an hour. I can't even imagine. Mm. Yeah, might as well run, run level four missions or something. People need I to feel... Shoot, you might as well run level two missions. People yeah. need to feel that progression. Another interesting thing now is that large, large skill injectors are going up in price as well again. Uh, they dropped, of yeah. course, when we had um, all of that SP coming in from... Uh, the yearly anniversary and uh, also the daily login rewards. Well, so you'll, they have... you'll find that they're all going to be linked together. So when you have Plex certs, injectors and extractors, and I guess hypercores count as well, all of these things are going to follow each other with a minimal amount of lag. So uh, Plex is going up a lot right now. Uh, we, we discussed this the other day, most likely you know related to at least in part the uh, the Russian pricing change, the rubles pricing change, and that is now that effect is now spilling over to other other market commodities. I'm seeing there was a, there was a, sorry, go ahead, man. Skill injectors have um, bottomed out, but they're they're slowly creeping up. It's uh, very slight. Yeah, they just the last two days they went from around seven. 20 on sell orders to 760 now in Jita or perimeter. So they, they, they look to be starting to going up again. Oh, yeah. Flex prices nice. had a very short spike. Uh, pr probably, I think that's a good uh, assessment as well. It could be related to the Russians uh, having the pricing of Omega changing. Yeah. But uh, then CCP, of course, uh, <laughs> came in and did a 10% discount all of a sudden over the weekend. So it's gone down again. So it's, yeah. it's, it's about the same level of 2.6 million on sell orders and 2.5 on buy orders. But that's, that looks to be a bottom for the Plex now. Well, that remains to be seen. We, oh, may, yeah. we, may, we may be looking at, uh, once again, 1 billion isk a month to Plex or less. It's just that it's been on this level for quite a while now. But 
like speculating in Plex now is a fool's errand. Right. Yeah, absolutely. It's way too volatile at this point. Well, injectors going up. Interesting. It's usually tied to Plex. We'll see what happens there. I think it, I mean, this long slump here since, oh, what, April? Mid-March? Yeah, mid, mid-March mid it started going way down and it, and it, the rest of March, all of April, and now all of, it, it bottomed out halfway through May. Yeah, it's yeah. been stable uh, for the past, like, week or two. Even though Plex, well, Plex kind of stabilized too, right? Let's have a look at Plex. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it correlates. It's, uh, skill injectors are very tied to the Plex prices since... Yeah, all of the commodities. If the Plex prices go up, then, then, then skill injectors will have to go up as well because the skill farmers won't make a profit otherwise. So you have this, the standard supply and demand. You have less profits for skill uh, skill farmers, which means that more farms become inactive, and then the supply goes down while demand is the same. It's it's Plex and all items that are only obtained through Plex. So yeah. you have certs, injectors, extractors, Plex, and hypercores. Those those items are all inherently linked to each other. The injectors yeah. only come from extractors. Extractors only come from Plex. Certs only come from Plex. Hypercores only come from Plex. Plex only comes from cash. That's, that creates a system in which those items that I just listed, their graphs, if you zoom them appropriately and line them up, you will see that those graphs are almost in lockstep at all times. And there's only slight variance. At well, there's, there's lag times. time, but they move together, but there is a lag yeah. time. A little bit. One, uh, one will move ahead and the others will catch up and it will take a couple of hours or days at most. I think the no, you, I mean, it can be longer are, than that. It can be yeah. a couple of weeks. Injectors Maybe can take a few days, I think, but but it always will uh, travel with Plex. I'm looking at Plex now, and that that rush on the bank to buy up Plex because it was going to get more expensive to use rubles was very short lived. They've knocked it right back down to where it, it was. Here, so, well, I think it was curtailed by this 10 percent Plex sale. Yeah. So. That, yeah, that what, may, those two fact, factors may wore it out over the weekend. Yes, right, because the weekend's when you have the most amount of uh, volatility or volumes sold. So we'll see where it yeah. ends up. But I'm encouraged by the injector market getting a little, a little more solid. Well, when, when, when injectors are up and all the other things are down, then skill farmers are happy. Well, it's interesting you say that because it's important to like derive the reasons for a lot of this, right? So, what is skill far? What does skill injectors going up mean? It means either the supply or the demand is going up. So, yes. if we look at the, the the way the Plex has alternated, right? There, there hasn't been a large change in the in the quantities of these things. Like, I mean, you can pull the data there and look at the, the daily quantities. And from mm -hmm. what I can see, the, the quantities haven't gone up or haven't changed a ton, right? The, de the supply is mostly the same, which means then the demand is going up. And if you work on the assumption that the demand of large skill injectors is going up, that means that new players are coming in and they're wanting skill injectors to fly ships they haven't flown before. That's what, you know, drives this. And when you have that, that means the game itself at the bottom end is much healthier because those players are buying Plex to sell for ISK to buy large skill injectors in most cases, which means the price of Plex is continually going to get pushed downward, even though the price of large skill injectors will eventually correlate backwards. Yeah, it also offsets a little bit because, of course, like you mentioned, that's a very good assessment as well. Uh, there, there have been a lot of new players coming in, so new players are more likely to buy Plex with real money and then sell it on the market um, and buy the skill data so they can get ahead and catch up a little bit. But at the same time, when they sell that Plex, that pushes, it, I mean, that increases the supply, which pushes down the Plex prices, which reduces the costs for the for the skill farmers, both in terms of the Omega, the MPTC, uh, the skill extractors, all those, those things that Fensuri mentioned. So their margin, margins actually um, increase, which 
in turn means that there's going to be more skill farmers firing up the skill farms to take part of that increased profit. And then eventually it's going to offset and reach an equilibrium. But it's quite interesting because the, looking at just how much Plex price has gone down, you would have expected the skill injector price to go down as well. But that has been a big offset by the what I think is that, that huge uh, increase of new players coming into the game. Well, it's, it, it's important to know the purpose the purpose of skill farming. I'm sorry, Matt, Earl, why don't you just go finish ahead the point. Yeah, talk sure. about it. Go ahead. Um, so sk skill farming, if you, do, if you do the math, then it tends to work out uh, pretty much break even. You can very, very, you know, you can make a very, very small profit on some month, you know, if, if you're operating on a month to month basis, which is generally not recommended, you should be operating on multi month or even a year long basis. But generally, skill farmers that, have really good months when there's free SP events because yeah. all of a sudden their calculations go from basically break even to, you know, plus 250k SP per character, which means every third character they get basically a free yeah. large skill injector, which turns their profit through the roof. So a lot of them just kind of hold barely above break even, even hoping to hit one of those events. And when they do, they make a huge profit. Yep. And and the reason why people... So let's, let's ignore the free SP for a moment, even though that is absolutely part of the equation. Let's ignore that for just a moment. If one were to operate a skill form over the course of a year... Then the costs, which is plex, certs, extractors, and the profits, which is injectors, pretty much wipe each other out. You may end up a little bit in the red some months, a little bit in the black some months, but for the most part, you're going to be about break even approximately with a small amount of variation. So the reason that people are doing this, if they're not making money, is to de essentially Omega is a bundle. Omega, you buy a, a bunch of unlocks, capabilities that you wouldn't have otherwise, the ability to run multiple accounts, the ability to use ships and modules and implants and such. And the other part of the bundle is you're buying training. Training isn't free. Alphas don't get training. Alphas get, a, you know, to train 5 mil and then it stops. So you're buying training and you're buying unlocks. So there's a lot of players that have a lot of characters. They don't actually need to train, but they do want them unlocked. So that is like the core value of a skill farm. It is that I am paying, you know, I'm paying for Omega. It's giving me two things. I'm selling off one of the two things, keeping the part that I want. And, and essentially I have, you know, Omega unlock characters that I'm not paying for. And then you add in the free skill points that are effectively reliable because over the course of any given year, you're going to get a cup, you know, a, a couple of injectors worth of free skill points if you just play consistently. And if you add that in, then these things operate ever so barely in the black. But as far as like people spinning up more skill farms to respond to a favorable market or spinning down skill farms to, you know, to respond to an unfavorable market, I don't think that that happens very much because people aren't doing it to make money. They want that account to have Omega. Well, it's, it's important to remember two other things, right? So to spin up a skill farm, you need a character with 5 million SP to start. Yep. Which in most cases, because you want to do this on an alpha account, is almost an 8 to 10 month investment in time. Yep. You have to sure. take a character, and then you have to train them for that situation for 8 to 10 months. So there's a massive delay in terms of skill farming. Um, yep. That's, really? that's not, what I, that's not really? what's usually meant by spinning up. What, uh, yeah, by you, oh, so in this case, it's what, by spinning once, up, I meant people one second, have, I have a skill to know, farm that they shut down and react. You guys can hear me. I want, I want to know. Billy. Yeah, go ahead. Billy, are you in the shower? No, I'm cooking bacon on the stove. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, but it's Sorry. What, what's spinning in this yeah. context, context means. You have, that yeah, you have skill you, farms you, that you activate. We're talking, we're talking about the... We're talking about exactly we're talking about those who have hundreds of accounts those do it for profits and those when when the market seems to be running dry for extended periods of time they will or, uh, like basically just not omega their accounts for for a while and then they will buy omega again once once the profits increase in reality the last six months or five months at least have been very profitable and increasing in profit margins uh, for the skilled farmers to the point where I haven't done the calculations recently, but I have quite a few accounts that I skill extract. And even just having a single Omega uh, character, you don't use the multiple pilot training certificates, that is. I still make uh, an extra um, uh, skill injector, large skill injector that I can sell on those characters. So 
for the mm-hmm. past couple of months, skill, skill, uh, skill farms have been very profitable, uh, which also means that you're going to have those people coming back that have had 100 accounts just lay, laying dormant, really. And uh, that floods the market, and then the margins correct themselves, etc., etc. But it's been offset by what seems to be a huge amount of new plays coming in, which is fantastic. Yeah. Um, more on this offline. I just wanted to point out one last thing before we go. We're at the two-hour mark, and that is how to interpret um, how to interpret the market. So you can kind of figure out if a price is going up or going down, uh, or at least what the trend line is. So uh, I'll try to explain what what I think it is, and you guys can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, but what you're looking at that red dot there is the median price. And that is like, if you average out how many were bought and how many were sold, what the prices uh, met at. So if somebody sold for 10 and somebody bought for five, then this number is going to be a 7.5 when you average everything out. So that's what the red dot is. That's the medium. So what you want to see is where that is in conjunction to the trend line. Uh, so that is, uh, if you look at this, there's a range of the highest versus the lowest. Yeah, the, the line that you see, the the vertical line, the, the top end of that right. line represents the highest individual transaction, and the bottom of it represents the lowest value individual transaction. So when you are seeing the red dot, essentially, at the top of that stick, that means a lot of the, the average of the volume that's being sold is actually at the top higher price, not the lower price. And, and what you, that generally means is that people are buying directly off of sell orders. When the dot is towards the bottom, people are, gen, the transactions are happening on buy orders. Right, so if you look here, you see the opposite effect. You see the red dot is near the bottom of that stick, which means that the, uh, the price is being pulled down and if that continues, you will start to see the five-day average slope down and the 20-day average will slope down but slower. Uh, so you will see that that will affect the trend over time. But that for that day, people were buying off the buy orders or they were getting their, their uh, buy orders fulfilled if it's at the top, I think. So, yeah. So, again, that red dot, that medium dot, you want to see where that's positioned on the stick. The higher it is, the more it's going to pull the... The price up the lower it is on that stick the more it's trending towards pulling the price down that's just the easy way to think of it offline everybody joins what's that are you running a fleet and cooking bacon at the same time billy no i said you wanted to go offline yeah or you- uh yeah because it's two hours so do you have any other news? I don't. Okay. Just in case you wanted to make it. Watch talking stations tomorrow. That's right. Interview with. Let's uh, leave. Let's leave with an announcement. CCP, yeah, matter all. You go ahead. No, you. Well, who's going to be on? Uh, so I, it'll be uh, Carneros, January, McLeod, and myself, and the guests uh, are going to be um, CCP Sledgehammer and CCP Coyote. And tentatively, CCP Burger. Uh, we are going to be discussing. So, to to give the, the little blurb for the show, um, CCP Sledgehammer and CCP Coyote uh, have uh, have been working on invasion content since the beginning. This was their uh, first major project, and they have been they have been on it since the start. And we are going to be talking about them about the process of developing and deploying this content so check that out tomorrow 1600 that's the talking in stations sunday show uh it'll be all you need to know about what's happening with invasions and high sec well, less less about what's happening because that's a new so okay. what's happening okay. with invasions right now is a news you know reporters show we do that every day you know on your your show on this show but what what we have with these two people is unique opportunity to see into the experience of actually building this content, you know, as an, as an iterative process from chapter one to chapter two to chapter three, they built tools, they built content that didn't exist before. Invasion doesn't look like anything else that we've seen. Uh, and now it's chapter three, things have really changed. And these two 
essentially new game designers for CCP have really shaken up just about everything. So this is a really excellent opportunity to find out about what led to what we're seeing today. All right. So get to know the minds behind the invasions. All right. I, I'm going to oversell it if I talk any longer. So I just want to say thanks guys for showing up today. And thank you out there. Remember to watch Talking in Stations every day uh, right here at this channel at 1500 or the Sunday show at 1600. And also, if you want to help support us, go to patreon.com slash and uh, or you could subscribe or you could um, just give us, you know, a thumbs up, a good rating, uh, give us a review wherever you listen to this or wherever you see this. Comment on our YouTube channel, uh, which you, you can find most of this stuff on. All this you can find through talkinginstations.com. So for now, thanks very much. Let's go ahead and raid someone here. Joe Bain. Uh, let's, let's raid Joe. He's, always, uh, always low sec PVP Joe Bain. Joe Bain, he's, uh, he's, good. he's good to watch. Here you go. As reliable as anything. Yeah, we have to have him back on. I've been trying to... Uh... Hey, hey, what's Joe Bain doing? Kill it. In low <laughs> How do you know? Because he's Joe Bain. <laughs> Here you go. Enjoy some Joe. Enjoy some Joe. See you later. All right. See you later.